Hey everyone, welcome back to the Flesh Tools tutorial series for SideFX's Project Grot. This chapter is by far my favorite, because we will go over the fascinating edge bundling algorithm, or also called graph bundling. Edge bundling is an algorithm that takes a random group of curves and iteratively moves them closer together based on their proximity. This can be used for visualizing statistics such as migration patterns, but I thought it would also work perfectly for adding organic structure to this tool. I want to give a massive shout out to the Vex god Yunichiro Horikawa because this would not have been possible without him. If you want to get really deep into Vex, you should check out his Vex for Algorithmic Design series. It's awesome. Let's get into Udini. Alright, here's where we left off. We have our placeholder rocks, we have our raycast splines, and now we want to make them go from these perfectly straight connections to something a bit more organic looking. If you've watched the Ruins tutorial series, you've seen that I used a slightly different approach, um, where we basically just resampled our curves and then for each point we checked the closest surface and then made them move towards the direction. And I think it worked pretty well for what we were trying to achieve, but I think for something that is a bit more freeform, a bit looser, such as the flesh cluster tool, we need a more adaptive algorithm to help us achieve what we're looking for. And the edge bundling algorithm is exactly what I needed for this. Basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our curves and then we're gonna create a volume. Then we're gonna use this volume to drive a solver that will iteratively push our curves closer towards the denser areas of that volume. And what we're going to effectively do that way is that all the splines that are closer together are going to move closer together and give off this visual of muscle tensing up or something. The approach I'm going to show you is very heavily influenced by Yunichiro Horikawa's approach. However, I will try to simplify it for the sake of this video, but if you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend you to check out his full one and a half hour video only on this topic. But yeah, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing we need is a volume, just an empty volume. And for that, we can get a volume node and plug that in. We're not going to really see anything, of course, because it's empty, but we can verify that there is something by just typing in one and then we see uh, then we see where the bounds are. Talking about bounds, it's a good idea to add a bound around it to just give a bit of a buffer because in these areas where we just touch at the border, our algorithm might not work as intended. So let's just add a bound node and then extend it by one meter in all directions just to be safe. Okay, and I'm gonna increase the sampling divisions. Okay, but we know it works, so let's turn this back to zero and the last thing we have to do is type density. This is important, otherwise it's not going to work. Okay, so let's move our volume over here. And what we want to do now is we want to fill this empty volume based on the proximity to our splines. So a way that we can do that is by using a volume wrangle and calculate the XYZ distance to the nearest voxels. Beware that I chose a volume wrangle. Uh, an attribute wrangle looks almost identical, but you can see that one has this little speech bubble and the other one has this little cloud thing, and only the volume wrangle is gonna work for this. So I'm gonna put the volume into the first input and my spline into the second input. I want to fill the density attribute using an XYZ dist function. And what we need to supply is we need to supply the geometry and the vector of origin. And we can just say, well, input one, because it's the second input, and then we say add p. And if you're wondering why everything is now filled with volume, well, that's because the farther away something is from the spline, of course, the higher the value is gonna get. Uh, so what we want actually is pretty much the opposite. And what we can do to get that is we can just get another line of Xcode and say add density equals, and then we do a fit01 function um, to clamp these values. And we can say add density, and then instead of clamping it to zero and one, we can uh, clamp it by one and zero. And in that way, we are also inverting it at the same time. So now you can see that roughly around the splines we get this little fog and the reason why we want this this nice fog what we can do with that is we can extract gradient information which will give us directionality because we want to use this information in a solver to gradually push the points in a certain direction so to get that we can get a volume 
analysis node and we want to analyze the gradient. What you can see is that before we only had this density attribute that is a, a scalar value and now we have this x, y and z value. So we can now use this to drive our solver. Okay, so the volume part is done. Now we just need to prepare our curves. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to resample the curve so we have more points to work with and then we want to get a solver and we're going to plug the curve into the first input and the volume into the second input. And then we're going to dive inside. The way a solver works is that it iterates over our timeline. So for each frame, it's going to repeat whatever we're going to do in here. It's kind of like a for loop, but yeah, but over time. And what we want to do now is we want to get an attribute wrangle, just a normal attribute wrangle um, to run over on points. And in the first input, I'm going to put um, this previous frame node and in the second input I'm gonna get my volume and what we want to get is we want to extract the velocity from our volume so I'm gonna type vector bell equals volume volume sample V we want to sample the vector we need to give it a geometry the name of the volume and uh, a position so we're just gonna type in one because we want to access the cloud and then density and then at p so now we have um, the velocity stored in our variable and now we just have to say at p equals at p plus bell and you can immediately see that something is happening but it's happening in a rather violent way and it looks pretty janky but what we can do is we can multiply this using a multiplier so we can gradually add that in and another thing we can do is we can add a blur to to get rid of this uh, this jank so make sure to disable pin border points go down a bit with the step size and maybe add some more blurring iterations and let's see what happens Okay, so it kind of works. We can see that they are moving towards their shared center, but of course it's also very noticeable that the curves are moving away from where they started. And there's two reasons for that. The first one is our blur, because as you start blurring these things, it starts to kind of collapse in on itself. And the other one is our attribute wrangle, because we keep pushing it away iteratively. So let's, um, let's go one by one. So the first one I want to take care of is the blur and like in the runes tutorial series where we were working on the flesh we can use a mirrored curve view attribute to make sure that the ends are being affected less by the blur okay so i'm just gonna get a wrangle again i'm gonna use the the little next snippet that we used that time at curve view equals at curve view multiplied by one minus at curve view and then we multiply all of that by four and that way we get this nice uh, mirrored gradient instead of this uh, zero to one gradient and so what I can do now is I can just go inside and go to my attribute blur and select the curve view attribute so this should already have some effect on our solver so if I increase this you can see that yeah nice now it's it's moving less than before but the beginnings and ends are still are still being affected by our point wrangle. So the last thing we have to do is we just need to make sure that we fixate these points. And we can do that, for instance, by using a group by range node and set it to points. And I'm going to call the group ends. The cool thing about the group by range node is that we can use the start and end parameter to select only the start and end points. However, we can't really see anything right now, so I'm just going to invert it to see what's going on. And um, the problem that we have right now is that it's selecting the global start and end, meaning it's going to select point number zero and whatever the last point number is. But what I want is I want the local start and end. So for each curve, the start and end point. That's not a problem, though. We can just go over here to the connectivity tab and just drop that down. And here where it says connectivity attribute, we can just enable that. And the good thing is we already made a connectivity attribute with our enumerate node, our PT ID. So we can just go back over here to our group by range and just type PT underscore ID. 
So now we have all these local start and end points. All right, so let's go back to our solver and in the attribute wrangle node. So basically I just want this code to run on all points except these endpoints that we just grouped. And we can do that by just saying uh, exclamation mark ends. So this is the, the inverted group. Basically, um, this code is now gonna run on everything except our group. All right, so if we go back, we can now see, yeah. And it, and it doesn't get old. Honestly, I think I've tested and recorded this for I don't know how many times, but it never gets old. I think it just looks so cool, and I'm so thankful for Yunichiro Horikawa that he made this video. I don't know if this would have been possible without him. And what's so great about this method is that it just really makes the tool figure out the aesthetic for itself. Because in the previous version, where we relied on a lot of tricks to get the visuals that we want, with this method, it just kind of figures it out on its own. And I feel like that makes it even more beautiful because now it's more of a, of a playful experience where we play around with our tool and let ourselves be surprised by what looks beautiful. It really never gets old. One thing to be aware of, however, because we are dealing with a solver, is that if I were to now uh, make changes, so for instance, if I want to move some of my rocks, um, is that we can see that the rock is moving, but our splines are staying in place. And that is because um, solvers usually store the result uh, in cache, which means that if we make some changes above the solver, the solver is not going to be aware of that until we press the reset simulation button. And now we can see that it's updated. What we can do, however, is we can disable this cache simulation toggle. It's a bit less performant, of course, but now it will update every time we make a change. And honestly, it's still really fast. So to finish off this lesson, I just want to add some thickness to my splines to make them look really fleshy. Um, let's get a sweep node, and of course it's going to error out, so let's get a round tube type. Ah, oh, it looks so awesome. And I'm going to make it, I don't know, 0.25 something like that. In case you have some uh, some mistakes like here, we can just get an orient along curve node just in case. Yeah, that should fix it. And like with the ruins flesh, I'm just also gonna add some end caps. Uh, the grids are really nice. And I'm gonna apply a scale ramp to give it more this uh, this fleshy look and make sure to change it to a b-spline, something like that. And we can play around with the scale to see just what fits. But we don't have to set this in stone just now, we're gonna go over the, um, the scale and thickness of these splines in a later lesson. And maybe one last thing I want to tweak, I can see that our curves that are fixed in place, that there's a bit of a distance because they've been kind of stretched over time. And what we can do um, is, for instance, we could, um, we could get another blur node and just uh, type in the same settings that we had earlier. So get a curve view. And then we can relax it. And that way we can see that, that this tension that is happening around um, the start and end points is now being a bit eased. It just makes it look a bit nicer, I think. But of course, like this is all, it's all subjective. Just try to find whatever works for you. I think I'm personally, I'm, I'm more personally for like a lower step size and more iterations. I think that looks pretty nice. And maybe some color just to make it look fleshy. All right, and that is it for the graph bundling chapter. I hope you had as much fun as I did and that this opened your eyes to a cool new world of solvers. And in the next chapter, we're gonna replace these ugly placeholder rocks with something a bit more uh, polished. And we're also gonna revisit the scattering of the flesh and see if we can add some variation in there as well. All right, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.